Hi everybody, I'm Elsa Bernadot and I'm one of the co-founders of Karma. Just to sense the room a little bit, who in here heard me speak yesterday, uh, heard me speak yesterday during the opening ceremony? Okay, cool. So quite a few. Um, sorry to you guys, I'm going to repeat myself a little bit today. Um, and then who in here are, um, is running their own company today? Raise your hand. Okay, fewer. Great. So to start off with, four years ago, me and my team at Karma, we sat down to discuss how are we going to save our company? Because for nine months, we had been building, had been building on a deal platform that it turned out that nobody wanted to use. So in short, we had absolutely no clue of what we were doing. Um, this is us in 2015. So even though we didn't know what to do to save our company, we knew that we had a great platform, but without an end user really, and that didn't really solve a problem. But we had always said that we wanted to you know, build the next big thing, use our tech skills to have a positive impact on humanity. So big vision, vague mission, and we were clearly failing. But what this realization and this original failure actually became was a starting point of what would become our mission for the next four years and up until today. So using technology to solve the global issue of food waste. When one door closes, another opens, and in our case, our failure was an opportunity in disguise. So what we said was that if we're going to do this, we need to change. And we need to change our way of working now which was probably a good call since our previous tactics had taken us almost to bankruptcy. Um, we started questioning everything. And since we didn't have any money left, we, you know, we became ruthless with our priorities and time was of essence. And we started small. We made speed a habit and part of our DNA and um, we started looking at things that could be perceived as waste and said, what if we can turn this into a business opportunity? And at the same time, we realized just how big of an issue food waste is on a global scale, and that one third of all food produced is wasted, and that if food waste was a country, it would be the third largest carbon emitter just behind China and the US, and I talked about this yesterday, which is just crazy. And we said, what if we could solve this? What if we could use this tech platform that we had already built in order to solve this problem. So we created Karma. Karma is an app that connects consumers with restaurants, cafes, and grocery stores who have surplus food for sale. And by applying this new mindset, you know, with being more ruthless, focusing on moves the needle, etc., um, we were able to make a, quite a massive pivot in three weeks, where we rebuilt the platform, we were able to sign the first restaurants to join and actually selling their food, and having the first paying users buying the food, and within the first seven days, we saved 150 meals from being thrown away. So, thank you. <laughs> yes, thank you. I appreciate that, because it, it sounds like a great story now, but li it literally sucked at, at this time. Um, so thank you. Um, but. We were up and running, we had saved our company, and since then our mission has been to solving food waste at a global scale. Um, what's made this possible is that our model is partially, uh, or is very, very scalable, uh, and partially due to being a win-win-win scenario. For the consumers, like everyone here today, we get to buy great food through the platform while saving our hard-earned money. Retailers, they get additional revenue while reaching new customers in the platform. And thirdly, we're all saving the platform doing so. And today, we've saved, here we go, 550 tons of food from landfill, approximately 1 million meals, a little bit more. And this is the equivalent weight of 43 double-decker buses. Um, people in the UK usually really appreciate this slide. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and in Sweden, which, we started, which is where we started, uh, about 5% of the Swedish population is backing us now and using our service. And we're now available in London, we're in Paris, and uh, we're hopefully coming your way here soon. But what I want to focus on today is this. 
what was it that made us actually go from what you could say a fuck up to a scale up? Um, our first year of these quite painful experiences actually formed the basis of what we would call operating principles um, that we've used to grow our company since then and that has taken us from that phase into a high growth phase. So that's what I want to talk, with you, talk to you about today. But what is an operating principle? Sounds so fancy. Is it a company value? Is it a rule? I would say neither. It's more concrete than a value and it's more flexible than a rule. It's a way of working. It's a way of approaching situations, a way of how you're basing your decisions and how you collaborate as a team. Is there anyone here who has actually written down your own personal principles or operating principles as a company? Raise your hand. Not so many, but some. That's great. Um, I would love to hear them if we get the chance to speak later. But today I'm going to share five mistakes. I'm going to talk about five mistakes that we did that ultimately ended up in five operating principles. We have quite a few right now, but I'm going to focus on five that has literally been like game changers for us to get where we are today. So first one out. Build it and they will come. Sorry for chasing you, but who has heard about that one before? It's always interesting to know sort of where the audience are. OK, not that many. Um, well, they won't, uh, is my experience. Um, at Karma, we are we're complete product nerds. Like we love, love, love innovating and building products, which is great. But uh, what happened was that we, com we became completely in love with our own product and all of the cutting edge tech that we were going to create. Um, so we became like the perfect cliche of uh, build it and they will come. So what happened was that we, when we decided, or were rather forced to do a pivot, we said that we were going to stop listening so much to all the noise from our friends, our family, entrepreneurs and investors who were thinking more or less like us, and instead starting focusing on the only one who really matters, like the end user. And I know that this can sound so obvious, but in our experience, like true customer obsession, it can be hard and it can be scary. And we got blinded by all of the smart people we had around us that were telling us what we wanted to hear, but not necessarily what we needed to hear. So our first principle became put users first and make data-driven decisions. Get out of the building, test everything and test a lot. Listen, learn, and iterate fast, and make quick feedback loops part of your DNA. Secondly, building for scale day one. Um, in our case, at least, don't. <laughs> um, we shouldn't have. Um, in our attempt to reach massive scale, we became too thorough. And by being so thorough, we became slow, we became unfocused, and we became stretched thin. So we spent months building our perfect product. But in our aim you know, to reach everyone, we ended up really not targeting anyone in particular. And we wanted to you know, create perfection before putting it in the face of our users, which made us lose a lot of time. So our principle became, we're not going to build a thing until we've created like, an early prototype to get an initial validation of what we wanted to test. And what we wanted to test in our case was three things. One, we knew, I mean, we knew food waste was, was a massive problem, but one, was restaurants really willing to sell their surplus food through this platform? Did they have any food to sell? Secondly, would consumers be willing to buy this food for half price? And thirdly, would consumers actually be willing to go to the location and pick up the food as takeaway? Because that's our model. And it turns out they did, and only then we started building. Um, and finally, or well, for the first time, rather, we could actually build something that was sort of based on data. Not a massive amount of data, it was very, very small data points, but at least not only our personal opinions. Um, and it taught us so much, these tests, about what the consumers actually did, what they were thinking, what they wanted, and the same with the sellers, and it saved us a lot of time, a lot of development time in particular, and I think we all know how expensive that is. So, um, but worth mentioning, like high ambitious, that's great. Like we've had a global mindset from day one, 
Um, so don't get me wrong here. It's just if you're building for the masses day one, just like be aware that you might never reach the masses if you don't get to the next phase. So the operating principle, build MVP to validate, and only then build and automate to scale. Thirdly, doing things right. In the first year, we were great at doing things right. Uh, not as good at prioritizing what we needed to do. So um, the, the four founders in, in our founding team, we are all academics. So you know, processes, structure, planning, analysis, it comes very natural to us. But as a startup, speed is everything. So you really need to make like, time one of our mo your most you know, precious assets and use time pressure in your favor. So if you would ask yourself, if I only had one day left to save my company, what would I focus on? In our case, we only had days left to save our company. So we started asking ourselves this particular question. If we only have days left to save our company, what are we going to do? And by asking this question, it created so much clarity on how doing things does not equal creating value. In our case, at least, it hadn't. So please don't fall into that trap. As an entrepreneur, as many of you know, the challenge is not to have things to do. The challenge is to do what moves the needle in time. So if you're baking a cake, it's not necessarily only about the ingredients. It's about the order and the mix of the ingredients that actually creates the magic. So if the answer to, if I have one day left to save my company, what would I focus on? If the answer to that question is not anywhere near your short-term to-do list, there might, there's a risk that you're my, you might be focusing on the wrong things. So please, my recommendation would be like, focus on what moves the needle. Don't get you know, too focused on to-do lists. Um, focus on doing the right things. Fourthly, solving problems. And this might sound weird because uh, in my experience, like that's basically what you're doing on a daily basis all the time, just like solving problems constantly as an entrepreneur. But we decided that we wouldn't take action, like instant action on problems all the time, because we realized that sometimes problems were actually symptoms of something else. So by constantly just like being very reactive to problems, we all ended up creating new problems sometimes because you know the core issue hadn't really been solved. So our principle became use problems as cues. Like cues for you. Don't make the assumption that a problem is the same as the root cause. Instead, approach a problem and ask why, 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 why is that, why is that, what is that because of, until you really, really found the root cause. And if you solve the root cause very early, it will save you a lot of time and effort and energy in the long run. So kill the monster while it's small. And lastly, and my personal favorite, is absolute truths. The shoulds, the musts, everyone, no one, always, never. <laughs> Don't you love them? I mean, like, you can't. Says who? Um, I think we all know that definitives are only definitives until someone proves otherwise. But again, we fell for this shit. And sorry for my language today. Um, but we fell for this, and I did it too, myself. Um, when I went to high school, I wanted to learn to code, but I was told that I was too old. When I went to university, I wanted to start my own company, but then I was too young and too inexperienced to do so. Um, and maybe that's right, but who cares? <laughs> um, but I listened too much to that noise. But eventually I did start, fortunately, questioning these truths. And at age 23, I did start my first company. Karma is my second venture and I'm currently learning to code. And I've never been more happy and stimulated ever. Um, hard work, yes, but incredibly rewarding. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so um, our principle or the principle is challenge truths. So if you want something, don't overestimate people so much. Don't listen too much to the noise. One rule of thumb that we have at Karma is that if a person, or the less hands-on experience a person have within an area, the more opinions and truths it seems that person seems to have, <laughs> for some weird reason. Um, so question your sources. 
every time someone gives you advice or tell you that something is true, like I'm telling you today, um, we tread carefully. <laughs> And we ask ourselves, is it true? Does it need to be this way? Does this apply for us, our company, our product, our industry, our team? So the operating principle is ask questions, listen to advice, but challenge truths. So that said, I do <laughs> really encourage you to reflect and question what I've said here today. Um, is this true for you, what I've told you today? Does it apply for you and your company? or your future company. Um, I'm still learning, I'm still learning on the job. Um, and six years in still feels like day one. And I firmly, firmly believe that there's like a million different ways of building a successful company. But hopefully by sharing our failures or mistakes and learnings from them, it can fast track your own journey and help you forming your own operating principles for those of you who haven't in how to reach success, whatever success looks like to you. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elsa. Let's have a seat and let's have a look into the questions that came from the audience. Um, so you, you know, um, you was, were on uh, a stage and there were different numbers flying around, something between five and 8,000 people yesterday um, who were listening to you and uh, uh, several hundreds now. And you must have seen in the, in the, um, the first speeches that were given in the introduction to the conference, there was this United Nations Sustainability Goals up there and people applauded, right? And your company is all about at least um, paying into one of them. So in my experience, you know, when I, when, I, when I saw and observed the audience reaction yesterday, I just was thinking back and I realized just a few years ago this would have been impossible. Like, no one would have cared. No one would have even known that these 17 uh, little icons exist, yeah. um, not even what they stand for. So what do you think changed over the last years that, that changed this consciousness at least a little bit mm -hmm. and that made the growth of a company like yours possible? Well, I, I think there's a combination. Um, definitely, like, an increase of awareness, a lot of people speaking up their mind. Um, I do think that social media has helped here. Mm. I'm not personally the hugest fan of social media, but what is cool about social media is that it does create a direct communication line between consumers and brands. And brands will do what the consumers tell them to do. So I think we as consumers have gotten higher, like more influence, really, which have created more awareness. And more aware awareness you know, drives entrepreneurs like myself to ask ourselves, like, okay, this is important. We know it exists now. What can yeah. we do with the skills we have to solve it? But also like technological advancements. Like, we're not the first one trying to do this this way that Karma does. There's been several out there who's been trying to do it for years. But for different reasons, it wasn't the right timing. So I think maybe 10 years ago, people wouldn't have cared. But also, I don't think people would have been as used with you know, buying food through an app, having your phone. Same from the industry. Like, I can see when we talk to restaurants, like, if they've been approached by a thousand delivery, food delivery apps before, they're, like, more open-minded because they understand that these kind of solutions are coming, we need to be more digital, and they can actually, like, improve my business. Um, because even though the industry does care, they're always, like, bottom line will always matter more to them. So they need to feel that it makes sense financially. And I think that we've started to get across with that message now that impact doesn't necessarily contradict profit. You can actually have both. There is actually a question about that coming up. And as I also said in the introduction, um, I mean, you're labeled 30 under 30 social entrepreneur. Um, and I have, you know, if I found it established a foundation last year because I had this impact wave and, and uh, well, space tech is a lot about sustainability, even if it's not intuitive, but I also thought, okay, I need to make it more clear that I care. And I established a foundation. And yet this whole notion of, of giving back and creating something impactful and not making profits is not making our life easier, isn't it? So how do you jump over that? S sorry. In a sense, how do, you, how do you make clear also to the investors, you got an investment last year. Mm. Um, to your investors, said yes, you are 
I'm doing something very impactful and there will be a financial return at some point. So how do you manage uh, to do this? I mean, I want to give you a fancy answer, but I think it's just a grind, like showing that they don't contradict each other and that impact is the future, but also, um, you know, today, how can I phrase this? Sometimes when we talk about sustainability with investors, for example, mm. they get a little bit scared and they think like, oh, okay, no, 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 we, we, uh, I mean, we want to have a good return of, of uh, our capital, etc. And we show them that like, if we want to have, like we can have an impact on a global scale using technology, the technology there is there. But a sustainable company is also a profitable company. So we make it very clear for the investors like we're not a non-profit. Like we're here to make profits, which can sound, it can sound provocative, but it's because we think that the way to really reach a global scale, we need to be a sustainable company, and that's a profitable company. Because the more muscles we have, the more we can do. And I've, I do think that they're starting to get that. Do you think the claim social entrepreneur will disappear? And so will, do you think the claim social entrepreneur will disappear and it will just like natural that entrepreneurs do stuff that matters? Okay, that's not interesting. Yet. I don't know. Um, I, I think that will take a while, actually. If you would define a while. So when are we going to sit here and say, hey, it's actually nine out of 10 companies who, who make a difference? Will that be in 10 years, 20 years? What do you think? I'm not sure we will get there, actually. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I'm so <sort of> <laughs> sad. Um, no, but I mean, um, I, I mean, I, I think we will see an increase. I think we're already seeing an increase. Hopefully, I don't have the data to be, to back that up, but that would be my guess. Um, but I don't really know how the world will look in five years. But just looking back five years, given how much that's changed, I think it's quite hard to visualize how the world will look at, like. Sure. And in ten years, I think that maybe we're not even sitting on a stage anymore when you're doing <laughs> something else. I don't know. You're going to do it virtually. That's yeah. uh, possible. So um, there are questions coming up about your competitors. Oh. So how do you differentiate? Um, it depends on who you're talking about. Well, it doesn't matter that much. But I mean, I you also mentioned you're not the only one. So yeah, yeah, what's no, different about Karma? Yes, yeah, so we definitely have competitors. I would say the main difference towards our competitors are transparency. So. What I mean by that is that when you're buying food through Karma, which I hope some of you will do eventually, you will know exactly what you're buying. So there's pictures of the food, you will know the ingredients. If there's a shrimp salad, it will say it's a shrimp salad, which I think is crucial if we want to solve this issue because as a consumer, you want to know what you're buying. Okay. And as a retailer, like you want, you care about your brand. Like it's important for you to you know, install trust and certainty for your customers. And a lot of our competitors don't really do that in the same way. You're buying you know, a box of something, which is not necessarily only a bad thing if you're rescuing food, but if you're a vegetarian, you don't want a box of chicken. Uh, I don't think that's a good user experience. Um, and I think we need to be extremely like, if we want to have a change on massive scale, we need to adapt to the bigger masses and not necessarily those who are already bought into this issue. And to reach the, ma the bigger masses, you need to create an experience that is so close to their ordinary way of living yeah. that it's easier to use karma than do the alternative, because otherwise we won't. Like, we love convenience. That's just a fact, especially in developed countries. And in developed countries, this issue is the biggest. So I would say that that's the main thing. But we are trying to approach the same problem. So I would say that we are competitors, but we're also sort of trying to scream to the bigger market about this issue together. OK. OK, great. There are questions about yesterday coming up um, and uh, the fact that you might have shared backstage with Obama. But I'm not sure about if Secret Services would really uh, <laughs> appreciate that. So, so was there any interaction with him? Or, or if not, um, uh, what did that whole um, setup of speaking um, just before him mean for you? It, it was actually the second time I met him. Um, so I met him the first time in Berlin earlier this year, uh, in April, um, where they had a a big town hall for entrepreneurs, young leaders, as they call it, in Europe. And there was this round table of 25 people where we talked about the bigger issues for Europe and different solutions for, 
for them. Um, so it was actually nice to see him again. And uh, I don't kid myself that he knows exactly who I am, <laughs> but uh, he pretended to at least, which I perhaps should thank his team for. Um, <laughs> But he, he's been very, they, I would rather say, because we have contact with the Obama Foundation. And they have been very helpful, put us in touch with several chefs in the US to give us more insights of how that market is doing. So we're in touch with the former, former White House chef, Sam Cass, um, to get better insights, because obviously US is a, a big market. It's a big problem over there. Um, so that was the interaction, but his, uh, his Secret Service uh, team were very nervous <laughs> when we talked, so uh, I backed off quite, quite quickly. After. Do you think, um, you know, when you, I mean, obviously he's a, he's a highly charismatic person, standing um, and defending his values, uh, reaching, reaching out globally, and yet he is just one voice. Do you really, do you think someone like him does make a major difference just for us as entrepreneurs? Or is it more nice and looks nice and is marketing, but overall our situation will not change? I think, yes, it is marketing. It's PR. I'm, I'm not going to lie, but I think it makes a huge difference. I, I really, really do. Because don't underestimate like marketing and communications and like getting the word out. Because during our first year, for example, after we had launched, you know, the this, the new model, we had no marketing budget at all. Yeah. So every person who stood behind our initiative, it could be a restaurant owner, it could be a chef, it could be an investor, it could just be another entrepreneur. Like that was crucial for us and it still is. So it's easy to sort of, you know, throw that away. It's like, well, it's just PR. Well, no, it's, it's it could free be marketing. like, yeah, it's free marketing, but that could be like your livelihood. Like a lot of the crucial things that have happened to us have sometimes come from someone, like we just needed that quote from that person who sort of gave us an intro to that chain. So it's, it's important. It is important, so that's good, good to know for him, I think also. But also like motivation-wise, like I've never seen my team as like pumped as they were yesterday. <laughs> so they yeah. regain new energy, which means a lot as well. Um, the question that comes up here is uh, something about, it has a lot to do with pricing and being profitable because the, the question is raised, okay, could, you, could it be a good idea to give it to the people in need? Um, those who cannot afford kind of a, I would say, first tier meal, yeah. <laughs> but they could afford a, a second tier meal. So what is your approach about that? No, yes, definitely. I mean, we're here to, as I said yesterday, we want to create the first zero food waste generation which means that we need to take care of all the food, and I think part of that could definitely go to people in need. Yeah. But we also need to acknowledge that it's just, not, it's just not to just give away the food. If it was that easy, I think a lot more people would do so. It's a lot of challenges when it comes to food safety and regulations if you want to transport the food, which is most of the time the case if you want to move the food from the restaurant or the grocery store to the people in need. And that's why our model is that you actually go to the restaurant, however you know, inconvenient some people think that is, that you can't get it delivered. There's actually an idea behind it, because if we keep the food where it's originally made, at restaurants at least, we can actually cover so much more. But there are ways to distribute it. So we do have collaborations with charities, but it's, it's hard. And also a lot of those charities don't have you know, the capacity to actually carry all of the food that is available either. Um, but we are looking into like how can we make sure that all of the food that is uploaded through Karma is taken care of and that part of that can be given to people in need. I see. The pricing model might look interesting or might create some challenging... Um, so, sorry, so the pricing model behind it might, be, might become um, challenging, but it is obviously a super important um, element of, of the values you're standing for. Someone in the audience likes to challenge you a little bit. And... Um, Asking if your idea is stolen, and of course my immediate reaction as a founder is like, I strongly react to that because it's all about execution and not about the idea. But what does that question do to you? Um, I think it's fine to ask that question. I, I, I totally relate to your feeling though, but we need to be able to, um, to talk about those questions. In, in our case, believe it or not, it's not stolen in the sense that we find it, found it and said, like, we're going to do it. Uh, even though I agree with you that that could be a good thing as well, 
because isn't it better that more people do something and together solve the actual issue rather than one person should have a trillion dollar market and not mm. really getting there because it's going to be hard to get there, to be honest. Um, thank you. Um, but just since you asked how we actually, what happened was that we were sitting in a conference room after a board meeting, we had early angel investors, they had scrapped us from their portfolio book because they knew that we had no money left and our idea was not good. We said, okay, you know what? We have no one to really answer to anymore. What can we do with this platform? And then we started looking into, as I mentioned earlier, like what is the problems out there, et cetera, et cetera. How can we iterate? And we realized this was an issue and we came up with this idea. We called it micro sales, hmm. weird enough, because we were like, people love sales. You know, when, when you have like flash sales with clothes, could we do the same with food? Micro sales on a daily basis. And then obviously it took us like 10 minutes to Google this and we did <laughs> find out that Too Good To Go existed. Sure. So it's not that we didn't know about them. I'm just saying like that's not really how the process went. Um, they were not that big at the time. They're about two years older than we are. Um, they were very strong in Denmark, if I remember correctly. I think they were in a couple of other countries as well. And uh, I think we've learned from them since then. And I, I would guess that they're learning from us as well. If, if we're not still, you know, trying to influence each other, I think we would be stupid. That's true. And <laughs> competitors help you, help you um, to become better, right? If there is no competitor, there's something wrong about the business model anyways. Yeah, but also, I, don't, I, th I, think it's, I, I'm, I, I think it's quite ridiculous sometimes when you're like, oh, you should be angry and hate your competitors. Like, why should I? Like, we're making ourselves better, but also, again, like, we, there's a massive market. And look at any other trillion dollar market with these kind of issues where you have one player solving it all. <laughs> like, it's I would happily hear about that one because that would be amazing, but I'm not sure that that's for the greater good either. I so, we would say that might be scary, actually. Yeah. <laughs> that's my point. So, yeah. 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 Okay. So um, one of the things that need to happen um, so that your company can grow and reach out to many, many other hundred um, cities and, and countries of this world is a change in consciousness and that throwing away, throwing food away just becomes something that is not acceptable and that yeah. we personally stop yeah. doing it. And then we realize, oh, there is a need where I can get I need to get my food somewhere yeah. because I will not be able um, to eat it all myself. So what do you think, um, as a last question, um, could, could help us to develop this consciousness faster, much, much faster than just yeah. city by city, country by country, stage by stage, trying to convince people it's a bad idea to, wait, to throw away food? Probably a combination of things. I do think one, like the work that we are doing and Too Good To Go actually helps here because Changing behaviors starts with awareness. And um, I think a lot of people aren't aware of how they're actually approaching this problem. And I, I know that's the case for the industry as well. Mm. Uh, secondly, as I also mentioned, I do think that the consumer voice can increase this. Um, we started off, for example, in Stockholm in Sweden, uh, and we've grown city by city, but we've been um, when we started off, we couldn't really, you know, limit people to only download the app in Stockholm. So people downloaded the app all over Sweden and were like annoyed with like, I'm in Umeå, north of Sweden, and I can't save anything. Why is that? And yeah. we got really frustrated because we, of course we wanted to be there uh, and we're running as fast as we can. But then we said, okay, what if we actually help them help us grow faster? And we added like a button in the, in the app if you were outside of Stockholm where it said like, I'm sorry, we're not, we're not there yet, but we want to grow here. If you have any tips of like a cafe or a restaurant that you think should join, let us know. And this was just like a placeholder for us to sort of survive with all of those people getting frustrated with us <laughs> to get a better user experience. But what happened was like in the first days or two weeks, we got like 5,000 different tips of restaurants, etc., all over Sweden, which was quite cool because it was completely like inbound. And then we said, okay, this is actually interesting. We should leverage this to help us grow faster. So yeah. we created an ambassador program. And that way, we've been able to actually grow into 150 different towns or smaller uh, villages in Sweden. So the consumer voice is important, whether that's using you know, the ambassador program at Karma, but or just like social media, as I said. You know, support, you should you know, have high demands on brands, bigger corporations, because the bigger corporations needs to be behind this. And secondly, like support brands that you feel are making a difference, whether that is a startup like Karma or other companies. 
Um, I think that will help us grow faster. And eventually, politicians might listen as well. <laughs> and this all happens so much better and faster um, and in a, in a broader uh, approach if you actually have a company who does make a difference. Thank you so much, Elsa. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you.